Yeah, I, I think um, one thing we've skipped over is your specialty in, in the military. Um, so, I mean, that, in that industry, that was you being extremely good at what, a certain thing. You wanted the youngest to to reach that that level. Is that right? Yeah. So when I when I was in the Marines, I joined Recce, and then I'd done my sniper course. Um, the Royal Marines sniper course is one of the hardest sniper courses in the world to pass. Um, has lots of different. It's not just about pulling the trigger and, or sneaking about. You know, there's so many different um, sections of being a sniper that that make you more of an elite soldier effectively um, and so by the time I did that selection past that course I was 20 or 21 so I would have been one of the youngest trained snipers in the you know in the Royal Marines at that time and that was again come down to me knowing what I wanted and and instead of waiting five or six years you know, until I was ready, I thought, why don't I just go and do it? And if I fail it, at least I'll know what I failed on and then I can improve on that and then I can, you know, and then I'll go back and do it again. But I actually passed first time. Um, so, yeah, and, and that required, you know, a lot of focus, a lot of training and a lot of, I suppose, mental fortitude. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, um, this will be the last of the military questions. Um, and it is, like, what kind of mindset does it take to be a sniper? I think to become a sniper you need to you know there's two parts of it there's all the practical parts which are um, you know field craft basically um, and you have to be very good at operating on your own um, and then the second part is is more your personality and your personality traits are you happy and confident operating on your own you don't need another 30 guys behind you do you have the courage in your own convictions about making decisions? You know, uh, you, what I love about it is the fact that you live by and die by your own sword. It's very easy in a group of people in any walk of life to hide and to blame other people when things go wrong and the shit hits the fan. As a sniper, as, if you're working in you or, or your sniper pair, you are effectively responsible for your own life and lots of others and, and you know there's nowhere to hide and I quite like that stripped bare you know this is the nuts and bolts of life and and this is you know and it's how I it's how I work and operate now you know I, I love the fact that I'm responsible for being successful or unsuccessful. Just going off the book alone there's so much more to I mean your life seems to have got crazier and crazier as it's kind of gone on. Yeah I you know the the military part of my life is, you know, I, I owe almost everything to it because it's given me the confidence and the ethos and the courage of my own convictions to, to do what I want to do now. Um, you know, it certainly doesn't, the military part doesn't mean I'm any better, you know, at anything than anyone else. But I think in my own head and confidence, you know, I, I know that I passed one of the hardest infantry training in the world at the age of 16 that means you know in my head I have this confidence that you know I can I can do most things you know I I just haven't been taught most of them or you know if someone teaches me something then I'm, I'm very focused and dialed on learning that thing um, but the thing that made me join the scouts was adventure the thing that made me join the marines was adventure and then after I left and I started messing around and went offshore I then started to formulate this idea that I would then work in the outdoors. Not as an outdoors instructor because there's too many people doing that and, and you're very qualified and it's not well paid and and also it, so it didn't give me that, you know, I didn't want to be taking groups out on the hill and, you know, I, I led a lot of expeditions in South America and all over the place with, with young adults and it just like, I didn't quite know television existed yet, but all these parts were starting to like slot together. I had all my training, that was ready. I was like ready for whatever job came my way. Um, I'd spent all that time offshore getting ready for that. I um, had the confidence of my background in the military, so that was all done and dusted. And then someone asked me if I could get a film crew inside an active volcano for a TV program, and I was just like, Yes, I can do that. And, and then it just like the penny dropped. I was ready. I didn't know what I was 
preparing for, but when that job opportunity came along, it then suddenly clicked. Everything clicked into place from scouts right the way through, like over that 15 years to taking that job. And and it, you know, it, it then looking back on it, it was like that's what I was preparing for. And again, like I was saying earlier, you know, when you're when you're too busy with the minutia of everyday life, three kids, you know, your job, 12 hour shifts, blah, blah, like you don't have time to stick your head above the parapet and think about tomorrow, never mind next week, never mind next year. Um, but that's what the offshore part of it gave me was that time to then work out this plan. And, and so when I eventually got to doing that job in a volcano, it was like all of this just went do, 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 and into position. And then it, it was just like, fine. So I went to Congo, got a BBC film crew inside one of the most active volcanoes in Africa, biggest lava lake on earth, epic, epic sort of environment to be in. And it used every ounce of my skill set to get the crew in and out safely. And then I sort of came back and had a couple of weeks off and, and just like, I was like, this is amazing. Because I, I, I never watched television and to be honest, it never crossed my mind that television was a, you know, an industry that, that you could work in. Um, and so it just, and it was right at the time when Adventure TV was picking up and, and getting busy. And, and so it, with all the preparation and things I was doing, it just, I was perfectly placed at that time to, to get stuck into it. And, and, and I'm not saying that I'm, you know, there are a million people out there better qualified than me in cave diving, than skydiving, in climbing and all these things. but. You know, my main focus is more of a like step back. I have a jack of all trades, basic understanding of these adventurous activities, um, but I also have a more holistic approach to looking after people and crews and making sure that they're safe in these extreme environments. What was what was the first experience seeing the finished product? You know, like the shots that the crew had got. Like, was it was that? Did that mean anything to you once that had um, come out? It did. Yeah, it did because you know you you spend three weeks inside an active volcano risking your life to get all of this together and it's all compressed into eight minutes of footage and you just think how does that like how does that even compute but I've been doing this now for 13 14 years um, so I understand the process now and I'm much more involved in that process you know my job really is is you know with you guys it's with the crew it's everyone working together to get this end product um, and whether that's in jungles or up in the high mountains of the Himalayas or way down in a cave system, you know, where, wherever it is on earth or dealing with narcos in, in the jungles of South America, um, it's the same. It's about can-do attitude and, and looking after people. And, and it, it's, it goes back to what I was thinking about Acres of Diamonds. It's like, what service can I provide someone else, you know, by adding value to someone else or something else? And it's like, enlightened self-interest you know i get to do all these cool jobs i get to gob off about it on social media and have cool pictures with cool people in cool places but really you know you're helping other people achieve their goals and achieve their um ambitions and that you know that's quite important definitely and i think i mean i'm this is our thing that we do but i think film and documentaries and stuff is some some of the most inspirational stuff for people it really can like perspective on volcanoes. I, I, I've not watched the piece personally, but you know, it, it really, really can make a difference. And obviously that's an integral part that you're doing. It just doesn't happen if they haven't got someone who can do what you're doing. Yeah, and, and so I've, I've worked a lot with investigative journalists. So during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, um, which I talk about in the book, or chasing down um, tiger traffickers in Southeast Asia or, or doing the narco stuff in South America. Um, and these guys using the medium of, of film and journalism, you know, have have so, you know, they're giving a voice to, for example, tigers that, that don't have a voice, you know, and they're being slaughtered at a rapid rate of knots um, for for luxury goods. So, you know, if you if you can find a way of telling that story and telling it effectively by, you know, film, then, you know, you have much more reach than you do any other way, I think.